I'm Dwight Drummond. Tonight, the police chief says Toronto is ready for protesters at Queen's Park. Anyone who attempts to disrupt hospital access will be subject to strict enforcement. Will Toronto be able to prevent what has happened in Ottawa? We don't want an occupation. Roads around Queen's Park are already closed. Extra officers are on patrol as police roll out their plan to protect the public during the protest. Plus... This morning, we have begun implementing a new surge and contained strategy in our downtown core. Our goal is to end the demonstration. A change in tone and tactic. Ottawa police announced a new strategy for dealing with the truckers' protest. And... The Winter Olympics in Beijing are officially on the way. We'll show you why some of the usual pomp and pageantry is missing from the Games. Toronto police putting extra officers on the streets and closing off some downtown roads in advance of a protest convoy heading to the area around Queen's Park. Police say the steps are appropriate given what's happened this week in Ottawa. Lorenda Redekop joins us live from college and university. And Lorenda, protesters have already started to arrive. That's right, Dwight. It was early this afternoon when we got the first reports that protesters had been seen. It was large tractors, and they were seen in the northwest of the city. And that was really just shortly after police closed the road here along University, all in preparation for a protest that starts tomorrow. Already this afternoon, large vehicles started to roll in. Earlier, police shut down a long stretch of University Avenue south of the legislature, a day in advance of the actual protest. The public should expect a large police presence in and around the downtown core and other areas around the city at different times over the weekend. Police say officers have been directed to keep their body cams on. They've added more CCTV cameras to help with any potential investigations. And they're monitoring online activity for any possible hate speech. This is much more warnings and preparation than for the so-called Freedom Rally outside Queen's Park two weekends ago. The chief says unlike in Ottawa in front of the Parliament buildings, large vehicles will not be allowed to remain parked in front of the legislature. If their intention is to demonstrate, then they can travel by foot or public transit to Queen's Park and they can demonstrate uh, in person. But uh, vehicles will not be congregating around Queen's Park. If anyone is planning to come here for a protest that is not peaceful and that is not respectful, I would urge you on behalf of all Toronto residents and businesses to please stay home. The opposition at Queen's Park says the provincial government has been too silent over the past few days. The Solicitor General says uh, that uh, they're going to monitor the situation. Uh, Doug Ford says God bless to the protesters. Well, that's just not good enough. I'm extremely, extremely concerned. The Premier had also said everyone has a right to protest. This afternoon, he responded. Any harassment or acts of hatred or acts of violence uh, will have zero tolerance. The uh, people that are occupying Ottawa, folks, let's put an end to this. You know, we're, we're so close, so, so close to getting back to normal. The University Health Network has a plan in place, beefed up security and screening, a command center, working with police and the province. Some doctors are already planning a counter-protest. By all means, I think people should have their say, but when it comes to access, our staff should not be afraid or embarrassed to wear their uniforms. Our patients who are coming from far away should have access. And this road closure here, really that's about protecting the hospitals along this strip and also the staff and patients who will be coming through. And I want to give you a look at one of the tactics that police are using here. You can see this bus that's parked along University, so preventing any vehicles that may want to be passing by. They won't be able to get through here and so uh, the idea for this convoy protest tomorrow is that vehicles are going to be arriving from various parts of the city and congregating just north of here at Queen's Park. Dwight?
Thank you for that, Lorenda. Now, the city of Ottawa is stepping up policing around its anti-COVID mandate protest on Parliament Hill. 150 officers are being added to the patrol area and members of the RCMP are being brought in to bolster the police presence. It's a new strategy as the city braces for the expected arrival of thousands of new protesters. Olivia Stefanovic now with the latest. We're going to be uh, making sure that people are not getting harassed. Fed up with the chaos in their community. I have a church who had to postpone a funeral because they couldn't get the body into the funeral. People have the right to protest, but I don't think uh, they should be, you know, hurting other people to do that. Some Ottawa residents staged a silent form of resistance against the constant sound of this, blaring at all hours all week. Residents say they plan to walk the downtown streets throughout the weekend to try to keep their neighborhood safe as even more protesters descend on Ottawa. Incoming protester vehicles today and throughout the weekend will be directed to designated parking zones outside of the downtown core. Police responding with a surge and contain strategy, deploying 150 more officers, bolstering defenses and investigations. The lawlessness must end. While many Conservative MPs support the convoy and met with truckers all week, a change in tone from some of their colleagues. I understand what they're trying to do here, but maybe it's time to uh, take a look. Others say this is up to the federal government to fix. Perhaps the Prime Minister can get out there and meet with these people and find out you know, what he has to do to make sure they're heard. The Transport Minister did meet some truckers today in his home city. I ask for the protesters, now that they've made their point, to go home. But police don't have a timeline for removing the demonstration. I'll be the last man out if, uh, if nothing changes. This is for my grandpa. He was in World War II. And protesters show no sign of moving. Could the residents be unhappy? Yeah, I agree. Like, people have come in and disrupted some things. Yet protests are there, you know, to say, hey, we're, we've had enough. And if the people of Ottawa maybe should join. The complaints and frustrations of residents having little impact as demonstrators dig in. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. Protesters are also planning a major rally in Quebec City over the weekend. Dozens of vehicles have already arrived and demonstrators are gathering at Quebec's National Assembly. So far, things have been quiet and peaceful and the Premier says he wants to keep it that way. I will not accept that we start insulting citizens at the entry of restaurants or whatever. So uh, we are very careful and there's no tolerance. The protesters hope to stage their main demonstration tomorrow afternoon. It's unclear how many people will show up. The demonstration was put together on very short notice, and it's bitterly cold in Quebec City. Officials say city and provincial police are prepared for the protests, and officers have been in place around the legislature since Thursday. And protesters are gathering in the bitter cold in Winnipeg. A small but noisy crowd has blocked several streets near the Manitoba legislature, but there is still access to the building. Police are asking drivers to avoid the area. Organizers say they are trying to encourage a festive atmosphere and a number of families with children have attended. This is just the latest in a number of anti-COVID mandate rallies that have taken place across Manitoba. Residents of a Markham neighborhood are describing the frightening events that took place on a small street earlier this week that left one person dead. Greg Ross has more. Residents here on Purple Finch Road are still in shock after multiple gunshots were fired just steps from their homes. I spoke with one woman who heard the gunshots and saw at least part of what happened. She didn't want to be identified out of concern for her safety, but told me this. I heard pop, 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 and so I ran to the front door to see what it was and I saw three young men running down the street and then I saw a car go racing and the car, car hit one of the young men and he was thrown onto the road. She says the SUV crashed into the snowbank here at the end of the street. She says after several minutes emergency crews arrived. She says paramedics worked on the person who was hit by the car as well as one of the passengers in the SUV. Paramedics were working on the young man that got hit by the car and then the other paramedics were took 
the a young man out of the back seat of the car that had hit the young man, and they were working on him. They were doing uh, CPR. York Regional Police tell us that one victim died of gunshot wounds. They say there was a second person not considered to be a victim was taken to hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. At this point, York Regional Police have not said if any charges have been laid. Greg Ross, CBC News, Markham. Two people were rushed to hospital in serious condition after a shooting early this morning. It happened shortly before 4 a.m. on Spalding Road near Dufferin and Wilson. Two victims were found at the scene with gunshot wounds, but both suffered non-life-threatening injuries. Investigators say the victims were males but haven't released their ages. Anyone with information is asked to contact police. A teen boy has been charged with second-degree murder in the shooting death of a Toronto taxi driver in October. This past uh, Friday on January 28th, uh, our officers from Toronto Police received a phone call from the Sonich Police Department and that is located in British Columbia and they had the youth under arrest. So members of our homicide squad did fly out to BC. Um, they placed the youth in custody and brought him back to Toronto. It happened on, on October 24th. Just before 9 p.m., police were called to pharmacy in Eglinton after Reports of a taxi running into a fence. 73-year-old Christopher Jung was found with multiple gunshot wounds. He later died in hospital. Police say there are no outstanding suspects in the case. The accused, 17-year-old, appeared in court today. The country's top doctor says Canada needs a long-term, sustainable way to respond to future waves of pandemics so we are not in a crisis mode all the time. We need to be able to address the ongoing presence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in a more sustainable way. The virus will continue to evolve. So we need to also continue to evolve um, our measures, recognizing that further waves will occur. Dr. Tam says existing public health policies will have to be re-examined going forward because the virus is not likely to disappear anytime soon. She adds provinces and territories need to find a balance between health measures to curb future COVID-19 outbreaks and bringing back a sense of normalcy. Health officials say the focus can shift to preventing severe cases through vaccinations rather than trying to stop all new infections. But Tam adds some waves could turn out to be severe and disruptive and Canada will need to be ready for them. And starting Monday, the province is loosening restrictions for visitors in long-term care homes. It's a move both families and advocates say is long overdue. Natalie Collada has the story. It wasn't the 80th birthday Sandra Conroy had hoped for her mother. Pandemic visitor restrictions limited the guest list to just her. News today of loosening restrictions, a relief. I think it's fantastic. Um, I think my children need it, especially as my mom declines because we don't know how long we will have with her. Um, I know my mom needs it. Whether she remembers us in her visit, she'll feel that happy feeling and she recognizes us still. Starting Monday, the number of designated caregivers allowed in long-term care increases from two per resident to four. Residents with at least three vaccine doses will be able to resume social day trips. Then, later this month, general vaccinated visitors five years and up will be allowed inside. Residents, regardless of vaccination status, will be able to resume social day trips, and those with at least three vaccine doses will be able to have overnight social absences. This is something that we have been asking for, for for quite some time. There's a lot of work that, that is yet to be done. Particularly, says Stamatopoulos, around reducing isolation and confinement procedures at many homes. Whenever there's, you know, any case, be it staff cases that are at home isolating and residents that are otherwise healthy and triple, also, you know, quadruple vaccinated, still have to then confine in their rooms. And all the, you know, the normal semblance of, of active life in these facilities comes to a halt. So that's the other thing that we really need to address as well. Advocates say that includes requiring everyone who enters to wear N95 masks. It would reduce transmission, it would reduce the number of outbreaks and the need for shutdowns. Natalie Collada, CBC News, Toronto.
Nick, I feel like we're now paying for those above average temp days we had you know, a while back. <laughs> no. It's flipped on us. The, the bills come due. Yeah, at the end of December, it was the West that was dealing with all the cold weather. We had some of that mild weather, and now everything had kind of flipped, although they're seeing cold weather now, too. Um, anyway, it is entrenched in the GTA, minus 11 degrees right now. That's the high that we've seen through the day today. Uh, not much of a wind to speak of here, uh, although just recently reporting winds here up to about 20 kilometers per hour out at Pearson. Uh, with that being said, the wind chills close to minus 20. Uh, this at uh, Pearson, this downtown uh, Toronto, mark them up at minus 20 as well. So uh, wind chills, even though the winds aren't that strong, the wind chills quite low and they'll continue to be low through the overnight period. We've got uh, extreme cold warnings in effect for areas surrounding the city of Toronto, not actually the city of Toronto itself, although an extreme cold weather advisory in effect from the city of Toronto. Um, with that, we've got some uh, higher cloud cover in place. We'll see partly cloudy skies as we move through tonight. Looks like we're done with the flurries, although down around St. Catharines, still looking at a few flurries tonight. Tomorrow, generally sunny skies uh, across the board. Uh, tomorrow night, into Sunday, though, it looks like a few flurries are going to roll through. Might bring about a centimeter in some areas, but for the most part, uh, we're not looking at much, if any, in the way of accumulations. Cold night tonight, minus 17 degrees with a wind chill, minus 25, minus 9 tomorrow again with sunshine. There is a little bit of relief on the way, though. I'll tell you when, coming up in just a bit. Yeah, we'll, we'll use some of that yeah. good news a little later. Thank you. A coroner's inquest into the 2009 deaths of four men in a scaffolding collapse wrapped up today. It made several recommendations to the province to enhance and monitor safety regulations in Ontario. Farah Morelli has more. More than a decade after one of the province's worst construction accidents, a coroner's inquest is now over. Four men died after the swing stage collapsed in 2009. Since then, Ontario's safety regulations have changed. What the inquest looked at is, are those changes enough? I think that they, they really carefully examined the evidence and considered it very, very carefully and made some very meaningful and uh, worthwhile uh, recommendations. Here are some of the key recommendations. Change regulations to include a mandatory requirement for training of health and safety representatives who work on construction projects. Change the rules to make it mandatory that there's written proof that a work platform being used has been installed, inspected, tested and maintained. Require supervisors or anyone working at heights to take working at heights training and tougher fines or penalties for supervisors who break the rules. The project manager in this case was convicted of criminal negligence causing death and sentenced to three and a half years in prison. The company was also fined. I'm, I'm concerned that, again, it's going to take years and years before, you know, these are in, implemented. The president of the Ontario Federation of Labour welcomes the recommendations, but says many echo those made in previous reports. The Tony Dean report came out um, almost 10 years ago now, and we haven't seen actions on those. We haven't seen, you know, actions on, you know, numerous recommendations. The NDP's workplace health and safety critic says it plans to hold the province to account on the recommendations. Let's get it done. Let's make sure that every worker in the province of Ontario that goes to work comes home to their family. In a statement, the Ministry of Labour said it'll start reviewing the recommendations and how they may support the steps already taken to improve working at height safety in Ontario since 2009. The hope? The verdict will now allow the victims' families to move on. I do really hope that, you know, at this point in time, we're now at the end of that process, and we all hope that this, uh, that this process now provides some sort of closure for the families. Closure that comes more than 12 years after that tragic day. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. Russian President Vladimir Putin is in Beijing while the visit is taking place against the backdrop of the opening ceremony. It comes as Putin seeks allies in the face of Western pressure over the Kremlin's hostilities with Ukraine. Anthony Germain has more. Well, the Kremlin made this meeting happen, and Vladimir Putin has got something to show for it. A joint statement with Chinese President Xi Jinping denouncing NATO expansion. Now, the Russian army is powerful, but the Russian economy is vulnerable. And this Russian-Chinese relations expert says that Putin was here for one reason, and that was to shore up support. Given the some of the boycott, um, efforts of uh, boycotts we see from uh, some countries against the Beijing Olympics, uh, the fact that the, uh, President Putin would be uh, physically uh, present at the opening ceremony as probably the uh, guest honor, maybe the only guest honor from major big countries, um, 
So it shows, again, uh, in the individual trust, but also his own support. Now, with the eyes of the world facing Ukraine and 100,000 Russian troops there, questions about the Russian economy have arisen. And some Russian experts say that the reason Vladimir Putin was here was because it needs China's support. Russia would be slapped by massive Western sanctions. Of course, the West is not going to war with Russia over Ukraine, but definitely there will be massive economic sanctions. And uh, if Russia wants to survive those sanctions, uh, it needs close uh, collaboration with China. Now, there's no formal military alliance between China and Russia, but China's gone fairly far and went further today by signing on to this joint statement. Now, of equal importance is the mere fact that Vladimir Putin was here for the Beijing Olympics, and here he is during a pandemic. This contrasts fairly significantly with Western countries. Canada and the United States decided to snub the Olympics on the basis of human rights. And Chinese experts say that you can't overestimate how important it is that Putin is here, and it goes way beyond symbolism. So for all the talk of the Olympics being an apolitical arena to bring human beings together, some high-stakes geopolitical talks going on between two of the world's most powerful authoritarian strongmen. Anthony Germain, CBC News, Beijing. Premiers from all provinces and territories held a virtual news conference today. I'm Dale Minuckduck, and coming up, I'll tell you what they're asking for so hospitals like Michael Guerin can continue to provide service. CBC News. All 13 premiers from across the country joined in a virtual news conference calling on the federal government to provide more funding through the Canada Health Transfer. Dale Minuckduck joins us live now from Michael Guerin Hospital with the details on this. And Dale, what are the premiers asking for specifically? So Dwight, what they're asking for is an increase to the Canada Health Transfer, or CHT, which is meant to uh, provide predictable funding for health care. Currently, provinces and territories are picking up 78% of the health care costs through the CHT, with the federal government at 22%. The premiers are asking that the prime minister commit to increasing its share to 35%. Here's BC Premier John Horgan, who hosted the conference. This is about providing services for people. It's about wait times. It's about human resources in our healthcare system. It's about making sure that we can provide state of the art diagnostics so that we can address diseases as they come forward, like COVID 19, like cancers. Now, Premier Horgan um, said that the federal government was supposed to negotiate after the pandemic, but he says the time is now. And what about Premier Ford? How would a potential increase in the Canada Health Transfer affect his government's investment in health care? So Premier Ford was at the virtual news conference but did not address the CHT. He does stand with the other 12 provincial and territorial premiers in a statement. He says that rebuilding our health care system after a once-in-a-century pandemic, it requires an all-hands-on-deck approach. It is more important than ever that the federal government work with provinces and territories to urgently resolve the structural funding shortfall facing our health care systems. And yesterday, I spoke with uh, the medical director of infection and prevention control at one Toronto hospital who says it cannot live with COVID and address the backlog without further investment. Premier Doug Ford says that his government is investing $30.2 billion over the next 10 years uh, to improve hospitals and $324 million to help alleviate the surgery backlog. And Dwight, when it comes to the CHT, funding is allocated on a per capita basis and since 2017, 2018, uh, it has been increasing by at least 3% every year. But PEI Premier Dennis King says that in many provinces' health care costs are rising 7 to 8% every year. So that funding more critical than ever, Dwight. Dale Monoknock outside Michael Guerin Hospital for us tonight. Thank you, Dale. The family of a 35-year-old killed in a police shooting last month spoke out last night at a candlelight vigil demanding accountability and answers from the SIU. Moses Iruyu was fatally shot by police in the parking lot 
of a Markham Plaza on January 21st. According to the province's police watchdog, a York Regional Officer came upon him outside a vehicle in a shopping plaza around 9.15 at Fairburn Drive and Highway 7. His family says they were told by the SIU that there was an interaction with police and her area was shot and died in hospital. Now, nearly two weeks later, the family says they require answers. When we ask questions, a lot of it is, oh, it's part of the investigation. We can't answer that question. But we just want, like, even simple facts, like, what were the circumstances? Did he suffer? How long did he suffer for? Yesterday, the SIU issued a release asking for help to identify the driver of a vehicle in the plaza at the time her area was shot, saying it's believed the individual may have information related to the investigation. Images show an individual wearing a dark hooded winter jacket with light colored pants holding grocery bags. It's becoming more commonplace for police to barge into homes unannounced in Hamilton and Halton, according to new data obtained by CBC News. The controversial technique called a no-knock raid is supposed to be rare, and the new data is raising concerns with some experts. Bobby Herstova is following the story and joins us now from Hamilton with more. So, Bobby, what does this data show us? For context, Dwight, a no-knock raid is when a heavily armed tactical team burst in with no warning, and they usually do that if they think there's a high risk of danger on the other side of the door or if someone might be destroying evidence. So it's become controversial in recent years because some raids go off the rails uh, or they become deadly, like in the case of Breonna Taylor in the U.S. So the data shows, at least in Halton Police, uh, they used uh, surprise raids 19 times in 2019. The next year, 37 times. That's almost double. Um, and almost halfway through last year, they used 25 raids. Um, in Hamilton, there were 32 no-knock raids in 2019. There were 40 the next year, and about halfway through last year, 32, which is also an increase. Bobby, as we talk about this here, they're also talking about it in the U.S. because someone was just killed in a no-knock raid there. Why do you think we're seeing more of these no-knock raids? Halton Police wasn't very specific when I asked them, but here's what Hamilton Police Superintendent Marty Schellenberg said. We're seeing uh, an alarming increase in the number of firearms that are being uh, located on the street, whether they be uh, firearms seized, but also in, sh in terms of the shootings and in terms of homicides. So uh, that directly impacts the, the number of tactical warrants that are being executed by our tactical units as well. Researchers, activists, legal experts have been calling for more oversight and transparency, especially because of the level of force involved in these raids. Here's what Kevin Walby, an associate professor of criminal justice at the University of Winnipeg, said. The bigger picture is that there's no check. There's no balance on these things. I mean, they could, use, they could have 120 next year. They could have 220 uh, until we change the the way that these things are governed until s some court case intervenes in this idea of police latitude in SWAT team deployment, it could keep going up. And one thing to note, it's unclear how effective the raids are, Dwight, because people, or, sorry, the police don't track how often they lead to convictions or evidence seized. Bobby Herstova reporting from Hamilton tonight. Thank you, Bobby. Now, Nick, this has nothing to do with whether or not viewers are fighting with their significant other, mm -hmm. but it's going to be a cold night in the GTA for you folks. <laughs> yes, it will be. Uh, yeah, definitely take care to bundle up if you're heading out tonight. Um, we've got temperatures that are going to be in the low minus double digits, uh, down to minus 17 in the city of Toronto, and wind chills that will be in the minus 20s for a lot of places. We've uh, got extreme cold warnings in effect uh, across the region, although not including the city of Toronto. We're close, but we're not quite at that criteria. Um, these from Environment Canada. Nonetheless, so it doesn't make a difference if you're going outside, it is cold. And it's coming with uh, clearing sky cover, so we'll see partly cloudy skies through tonight. As we head through tomorrow, look for uh, that cloud cover to begin to uh, decrease even more. We've got generally sunny skies. A few flurries uh, just to the north there with a couple of weak streamers that are going to develop uh, through the overnight. Those should dissipate by the afternoon, and then we've got sunshine in the forecast for Saturday. Saturday night, though, through Sunday, we've got this system. I think it looks worse on here than it actually is 
in reality. Uh, might bring about a centimeter to some places, but generally not too bad. And then as we move through Sunday night into Monday, another weak system moving through. So snowfall accumulations to the north, if you're heading up to ski country there, be about five centimeters plus. Uh, however, down around the city of Toronto, uh, as we move through tomorrow night, trace to about a centimeter and then looks like maybe a couple centimeters of snow possible uh, through Sunday night into Monday. Now there is one model that's suggesting up to about five centimeters but generally speaking it looks like it's going to be maybe a couple centimeters uh, at most here and that's coming with temperatures that'll be uh, a little warmer than what we're experiencing right now. Winds are going to ease off as we move through tonight and then they'll pick up again uh, through Sunday so while Sunday's temperatures will be warmer the wind chills will stay cold just because the winds themselves are going to increase. Overnight tonight down to minus 17, minus 18, wind chills to minus 25. Tomorrow lots of sunshine, still cold though. Temperatures at minus nine, wind chills to minus 14. Gets a little better for Sunday, but again, the wind chill still kind of cold just because of the winds there. A few flurries on Monday lingering, and then by Wednesday, zero, maybe even one. I'd like to put a plus sign on that. We'll save it, we'll yeah. save it. Let us get through this crazy weekend first. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Nick. You bet. This weather update is brought to you by Fairmont Le Chateau Frontenac. This winter, enjoy an unforgettable getaway in the heart of old Quebec. A race against the clock is on the way tonight in Morocco to save a boy trapped in a well. Large crowds have gathered at the site where rescue workers are trying to reach the five-year-old. He's been trapped at the bottom of the 32-meter deep well since Tuesday. Because the entrance is so narrow, rescuers aren't able to climb down the well. Instead, they are dropping out large parts of the surrounding hillside. The child has been supplied with water and oxygen using a tube. Fingers crossed. It's uh, uh, stupid that they do it. It's, it's not, they don't have character by doing it. If they're actually going to do it, of course. That is some local reaction to a plan in Rotterdam in the Netherlands to dismantle part of a historic bridge. It's to make way for the super yacht belonging to who? Well, Jeff Bezos, the world's richest man, reportedly paid more than $500 million to build it. The full cost of dismantling the bridge would be covered by the shipbuilder. The city says a final decision hasn't yet been made. The Canadian job market took a major hit last month. Stats Canada says 200,000 jobs were lost in January. Both full-time and part-time positions were affected. And the national unemployment rate has jumped to 6.5%. That's up from 6% in December. But the experts say it's likely to be a temporary decline. Alison Northcott with the details. This was our spin studio in here. When Omicron hit, Drew Bathory had to close his Montreal fitness centre and lay off staff again. It felt sort of like the straw that broke our back in that it was another closure without any clarity. And this time he's told employees the closure is permanent. It was really hard. So many livelihoods did depend on this space. Um, but ultimately it was the only clear path forward for us as business owners and, and for, for them to know that unfortunately we've all tried everything we can. The Canadian economy lost 200,000 jobs in January. The hardest hit sectors were those affected by Omicron shutdowns, mostly in Ontario in Quebec. Gyms, restaurants, bars, retail stores and concert halls. The fact that we have seen many of our provinces having to shut down uh, parts of the economy, that will trim back the number of people working uh, in that month. Uh, we do think, however, that it will be a, a short-term blip short term she says because some restrictions have been lifted we want to just bring our teams back and some businesses are reopening we're fairly optimistic due to the fact there was a very short shutdown um, it definitely impacted our staff women and young people were most affected by last month's job losses rent wasn't paid on time car bills weren't paid on time. Nicole Jamison was out of work while Ontario bars and restaurants were closed she went back this week I just couldn't see myself you know, going somewhere else or not being in the industry. Most economists expect a quick rebound from January's losses with employers facing ongoing labor shortages in some sectors. Employers are going to be uh, searching for, for, for workers. Uh, they're going to be fighting for talent. Welcome news for workers in industries that have faced so much uncertainty since the pandemic began. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal.
As we head to break, let's take a look at where the markets close today. The TSX up 178 points, the Dow down 21 points, the dollar traded for 78.3 cents US. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Let's try to warm your heart on this cold night. When Hannah Odemi and her husband moved to Winnipeg from Nigeria in 2016, they assumed the government was clearing their driveway anytime it snowed. Turns out it was a kind neighbor who wanted to help a new family adjust to their first winter in Winnipeg. Days that you're down and you need someone to actually talk to. Just from that act of kindness, like I said, we've been able to build that relationship. It shows us that there are people around the world, even in your neighborhood, that can show kindness and it would go a long way to actually make you feel that you belong in that community. Odayemi describes Mark Hutchinson and his wife as God sent angels for their help over the years. The two families have built such a strong bond, they say they are no longer just neighbors, but family. See? I wish I had some neighbors like that. Just, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> that's eh? a great story, and it is warming my heart. It is a, a great story, and I can tell you, Dwight, having spent enough time in Winnipeg, having friends out there that are going <laughs> to help you shovel. Important. Is a, yeah, it is important for sure. I mean, man, if you think this is cold, Winnipeg is at least this cold. Uh, minus 11 degrees right now in the city of Toronto. Uh, not a whole lot to speak of in terms of the winds, but the wind chills still down close to minus 20. So that's what we're looking at uh, this evening if you've got uh, plans to head outdoors. There are extreme cold warnings in effect across the region, although not including the city of Toronto. Um, we've got them just to the north there. But again, those are going to be in place for tonight and tomorrow, and then they'll drop, I think, as we head through uh, the latter part of the weekend. Uh, a little bit of cloud cover that's just going to sort of clear out. We've got partly cloudy skies heading into tonight, a few flurries down around the Niagara region. Uh, nothing accumulating, although that being said, there are a couple of overnight systems that we're expecting. So again, for Saturday, say for just a little bit of flurries in the morning, things clear out. We've got sunshine. Saturday night, though, through Sunday, uh, might pick up a centimeter or so, maybe a couple up toward the north of the GTA, and then another system kind of moves through Sunday night into Monday, and that, again, could bring with it a couple of centimeters of snow, even to the GTA, but this should be an overnight event, not a big snowfall event. Four temperatures, minus 17 degrees again, wind chills of minus 25. You ready for that, Dwight, for tonight? We are not, but we yeah. have no choice, but we appreciate the warning, Nick. Yeah, you, well, you bet. <laughs> have a good weekend, Stay sir. Yeah, man. That is our show for tonight. Thank you for joining us. We're going to see you back here Monday at 6. Have a great night and enjoy the Olympics, everyone.